Nem tudtam jobbat kitalálni. Did you have a better idea than to give a summary of this quantum mechanics session and his essay on quantum mechanics? There's a big hype around it. The institution has just issued it, and every panel wanted to get a glimpse at it. So, in the following few minutes, I'm going to try to give you a subjective interpretation of the issue. Basically, this is about a bubble, which is also which also features in human adventure, and which claims that in order to defend yourself from this fantastic big universe which we refer to as a civilization and you can be free and where you can feel certain and safe and this is only my subjective opinion sometimes these bubbles uh, start changing and if new uh, hungry civilizations come along and then we get in, we, we are in trouble and these bubbles get um, they pop out basically. So let's refer to this as the bubbles of modernity and this is about to explode as well. Hanke says or writes that the great thinkers of the, 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 the 20th century uh, they were very much afraid of this bubble being exploding uh, and uh, they were afraid that this might um, might might really out and, and Actually, I was very much afraid that this bubble will burst, so I'm supposed to be a great thinker as well. Anyway, how can we solve these big problems? Uh, I don't know, maybe by means of some sort of cooperation. But how do we get to quantum mechanics? Well, one of the most typical and most particular issues is the issue of conscious. And Paul Davies says that the universe has realized uh, uh, about its own knowledge by way of uh, becoming conscious. And Hawking says that many thinkers, many fantastic thinkers uh, will prove by means of quantum mechanics that the human conscious has a cosmic significance. Honkish also adds a few perspectives. Uh, he also says that denial could be another issue. It means when a sewing machine and umbrella meet on the operation table. Um, also an issue of uh, neutrality. Um, and the third one is uh, that conscious, when your conscious is split, basically, and you don't know uh, whether something should be purely religious or purely philosophical. So I actually don't believe that any of the three um, should have too much to do with this, but I'm not an expert on quantum mechanics. What does Hunkish write about us? Well, I think he, we, we, it, it's a fantastic fantastic idea to explore the universe's uh, mathematical tenets and how the, these hidden harmonies can be discovered uh, via the interpreting of the mathematical uh, uh, complexities. Uh, yesterday I had the pleasure of listening to Vijay's uh, music accompanying Hankish's words, which uh, well, well, he started to say that he was lost, he was loitering, he was wandering. And it was a, an, an interesting game that we played yesterday with the music and Hankish's words. And the consequences, which I also tried to sum up about Hankish's words on quantum mechanics, it basically says that the word has become so complex, so complicated, 
and although we can describe the world with mathematical language, with um, the language of physics, with the language of um, of, uh, of other natural sciences, but it's it's um, it's something that um, might be too much for people, both for their intellectual and emotional energy. Uh, they might be eaten up by these kind of uh, trying to uh, interpret these ideas. For the impact uh, exerted on uh, the environment by humanity, we can say that human activities affecting the atmosphere, this is the title of my presentation, um, we can actually measure the composition of the ambient air. It's a fantastic environment, and you can see the major composites and elements of the air here, the chemical elements, and we know it's a huge agent. And in this system, you could, we actually, humanity could make huge changes during the past centuries. The second column refers to percentages, and that refers to the changes since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution uh, in the uh, 19th century. So you can see, expressed in a billion tons, what how the presence of oxygen has changed uh, and also the due to the huge amount of uh, coal that we burnt uh, it very significantly reduced the amount of oxygen in the air it doesn't mean that we are out of oxygen or we will soon be out of oxygen but it's a great change that we can actually uh, uh, follow now it's the carbon dioxide that we tend to talk the most about due to climate change and uh, the global warming and you can see it's an extra 43 percent change but ozone is another uh, aspect it had been unchanged for several billion years but when um, humanity arrived it uh, started to drop significantly so these numbers are not uh, by chance I mean it is these gases are present because they have their function you know the function of the oxygen we all know what it does in 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 the uh, on the earth but all the other gases and elements and composites have the very clear function and make they have a, a say in making our lives tolerable or acceptable and um, co2 is responsible for providing the right temperature uh, and actually it would uh, without the green ga greenhouse gases actually we would be having 33 uh, Celsius uh, colder uh, weather in uh, on our the earth now if you look at the co2 this plus 43 percent indicated in the third color now, if uh, there was, for instance, the same change on top of the Himalaya, uh, or if there was another uh, change of such magnitude elsewhere in the Earth, and it was be, it would be due to the human capacities and human activities, we would be really frightened. And we know that the atmosphere is unique because we don't see these gases. We can measure them, but we don't see them. And we can believe the scientists that these changes are there, they are happening, but we don't actually see it for ourselves, so we are not so much afraid. But if there was another such change, as I said, of such magnitude, which we could see, which would be visually there, I'm sure the people would get really frightened and concerned, and they wouldn't know what to do. And similarly, when at the beginning of the 1980s the ozone hole was discovered, and then scientists panicked. Uh, the scientists were really afraid where the end of this um, uh, development of progress would be and what consequences we might suffer. So the impact exerted by human beings is rather significant. 
and the atmosphere is also affected. Now let's make a huge jump and we talked about the composites of the atmosphere and we said that they have their definite function and if there is a change there will be consequences. As for the consequences, it's, they are very difficult to um, to notice or to trace. We know that weather, there are adverse, all kinds of weather conditions here that are very difficult to prog prognosticize and obviously the system uh, can change but it doesn't you don't see the consequences right then and right there it there is a kind of uh, it, it, the time the lapse of time until which you will realize the effect but if there is a change in the atmosphere and if you don't see the direct consequences uh, some people don't believe that there is a cause and effect in this they, they wouldn't believe that the consequences were triggered by those changes changes. There are some regions on the earth, uh, the so-called uh, Canary, you know, you remember the, the miners took Canaries to the, uh, under the earth and when the uh, Canaries stopped singing they left immediately because that meant that there was some kind of a problem in the mine uh, before an explosion and even it was before you had machinery actually uh, prognosing a uh, uh, foreseeing uh, uh, problems in the mine. And on the Earth, in the system, uh, ice has a very um, um, important uh, prognostic uh, value because it's, it shows very early what's happening in the atmosphere. And if you look at the current, current condition of the ice in the sea, I think you don't need to be a scientist to, to tell how many um, ice caps there are. And then actually you can and the white pixels on the satellite and it very clearly will show you that there is a great change going on. We can see that in the past three decades uh, the the ice um, layer uh, has uh, dropped by 40 uh, percent. So that's quite a big change and we have achieved that in three decades only. So these are huge changes that we are now experiencing. And if you look at the um, the thickness of this ice, uh, it's only a, a, a meter and a half in thickness. It used to be six to eight uh, uh, meters in thickness. So uh, if we look at the northern hemisphere, this is the air conditioning system for Europe. So this is what we, what actually uh, regulates uh, the weather and the climate. And if we have less ice or no ice, there will be consequences. We will have some unpleasant weather or adverse weather especially during the summer. So this air conditioning system, I would, I'm sorry to, in, uh, sorry to announce, uh, has broken down. And we can see the signs already in Hungary. During a, 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 a lifetime, uh, during one generation's lifetime, you can see the heat waves and the frequency of heat waves, which started in the early 90s. And before that, uh, time, it was like uh, anecdotes, you know, it's happened once in a lifetime, it was really a unique thing, but then the, since the 1990s, they have happened more frequently, and obviously uh, the meteorologist and the weatherman re register the data, so it's very quite uh, in interesting, to, it's, you can measure these figures. And there, there is a large number of heat days, basically, with very uh, so with scorching weather over 35 degrees of Celsius. And it's this decade, 
uh, we have registered 61 days of extense heat and we are we haven't finished the decade yet so if we are unlucky we will have a larger uh, number of heat days and you know that if there is a day when the Celsius goes beyond 35 that is very very dangerous to health it's hazardous to health and you can't you can't really just you can just lie in bed and you can't produce your you know it's a problem of human productivity and it can have direct consequences on humans health and especially certain groups uh, the elderly for instance and many other groups so after this I'm not going to go into detail but there is this huge change in the composition of the atmosphere which is light scale and if we go back to a uh, few, few million years these, these have been very solid properly functioning systems which have now been disrupted and if we see the consequences in the society and these are groups in the society where these facts actually do not reach their um, threshold uh, level and they don't seem to be responding to these so this is uh, the uh, happenings of the past few years a uh, decision by the president of the United States and this is a kind of approach reflected uh, for this kind of a survey that reflects the Americans' ideas. I mean, to conduct a survey uh, among the environment, I mean, among people about the environment is a strange thing in the first place, but what do people say about global warming? I mean, can you have choices here? You can say yes or no, whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, and you can actually could choose an option saying that the climate uh, there is no global warming you, you could opt for that in the survey so human ignorance has no limits really and well actually these are the two basic American parties the Republicans the Democrats and the, the uh, you can see the distinction between the two groups of voters and you can see that natural sciences are not objective at all because the results can be reflected completely differently according to whether you are a Republican or a Democrat. So a social group can neglect or ignore simple facts. It's not something like if you wanted to hold a referendum on the issue of gravitation. You can actually vote whether an apple will fall on the ground or not. <laughs> Now, in this situation, there are some facts which cannot be questioned, or at least are difficult to question. I mean, especially in terms of the impact that humans are making on the environment. I mean, there are some consequences that we cannot simply ignore. Some people still uh, deny these facts, and we can talk about the responsibility of humans, and we can raise a lot of related questions, and this is is the future and the future generations that are at stake here and how livable the world will be. So it's a responsibility of this generation, our generation, how you can handle and tackle these issues and whether you can afford to ignore the facts. Uh, just to finish, allow me to make a quick remark. We said that human has humans have huge responsibility and they also have a liability to prognose uh, the changes that can be expected in the future and how they can tackle that in the present. This huge freedom of information did not help natural sciences because the internet has all kinds of data which uh, which are which have no uh, basis and fundamentals at all. And simple people just don't know what to believe to. They get such a wealth of information, half of which is just 
stupid. I cannot really say anything else. But and some pieces of information serve all kinds of economic and social and other interests. So for natural sciences, the internet. Is, more, is, is not a blessing, it's more like a curse. Although the opportunities have opened up and people can get more information, but not only for us, it's for others, so we have no control on, on what's going on. And uh, a scientific book could not be published by anybody. I mean, there were some editors and there were some rules and regulations we had to stick to, but now people are free to write about anything, you, anybody can publish anything and they have a good marketing, they have a good PR uh, activity, so we can actually ignore gravitation, we can some people have all kinds of theories and they have completely silly ideas that look like science, they look scientific uh, but they are not so I'm really sad to see what stupid ideas and the sad thing really is, is that uh, uh, they are not, they are some, some of these are uh, put there in, on, on, on purpose and that's the bad thing about it. So it's chaos, uh, or at least about people, how, how can they tell? which is professional and which is not, but this is a typical procedure. So everybody has an opinion on this problem. It's something like football and weather. So environmental changes has become a topic that everybody has an opinion on, not always informed opinion, I must say. So this would be my... Uh, additional impact on this session's work and I hope that we will have some questions and we will have a discussion about this. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I would like to take you to a field, an area which nobody truly understands in the world. This is quantum mechanics. Einstein is one of the founders of the quantum mechanics, and in my view, he was uh, the greatest thinker in the 20th century. He didn't really understand quantum physics. Quantum uh, mechanic, uh, mechanics is a science of probability, and Einstein said that God do, is, uh, does not uh, play uh, games or roll dice and play like that. So, in spite of all this, basically it's a theory which uh, could be then verified very exactly with uh, experiments, which means that this is 10 on the minus 12 is the exactness Mm, that verified uh, the uh, quantum uh, mechanics. And a few months before his death, uh, Elemir Honkish, just next door, actually, I was holding a lecture on a completely different topic, and Elemir was following me as the next speaker. And uh, Honkish talked about the social science uh, implications of quantum mechanics. Obviously, he, some of his ideas of those were not exact or correct, because listening to him, I felt that his uh, thoughts and, uh, also had weak points, although I'm quite knowledgeable of quantum mechanics, but I'm uh, doesn't fully understand it. He gave me a plan for an uh, article and a suggestion uh, how quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical thinking could be adopted to social sciences. This was in English, this is what I gave, so basically this is what the, the text uh, was, and I think you can also access this. So he just listed the topics uh, which he collected for this. Uh, then we sat down, had a talk, and we agreed that we should continue but unfortunately uh, we couldn't because uh, of his uh, death.
So I believe that in an institute that actually took upon to uh, care and cherish his heritage, we must not overlook quantum mechanics. So this is definitely just food for thought and just to whet your appetite how quantum mechanics could be used in social sciences. I'm not giving you explanations, but if you one week too late, uh, maybe I can if, uh, uh, give you uh, these explanations. The quantum world is a very strange world. Uh, there are many peculiarities about it, but basically it requires a completely different way of thinking if you want to find your way uh, in this world. In, in the classical world is a deterministic world. We know at a given time, uh, we know what are the uh, uh, relationship between cause and effect and then make deductions from that. But the uh, quantum world is a probabilistic world. For example, the, when we know where the position of the particle, we can't actually give the uh, velocity of uh, 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 this particle or vice versa, but in spite of this, actually, uh, we can define and describe phenomena quite uh, well with this. Quantum mechanics have has three basic quantum phenomena, one being the duality of particles and waves. We actually used the fact that uh, light is a wave and atom is a particle, but interestingly, also, Light has wave or uh, sorry particle characteristics, and atom has wave characteristics. So at certain uh, moment, uh, one or the other comes to the foreground. The other is the tunneling effect, because we also got used to the fact that if there's a mountain and there's no tunnel, we just climb the mountain to get to the other side. But according to quantum mechanics, actually, there is a way to tunnel ourselves, so to say, unseen tunnels. So the particles carefully can climb or squeeze through these tunnels. This is what we call quantum effect. The third, which we call superposition and entanglement, which means that if you have a system or a particle actually can exist in several uh, states and we don't know which one if they are uh, at or where they are at if we could mm, define their position actually their quantum mechanical characteristics would uh, be lost for example if you think about there's a box and there's a cat inside. We don't know whether the cat is alive or dead. 50% for both. And in order to find out, we have to open the box. The opening, the act of opening, is the measurement. This is the, when we're using a quantum mechanical measurement, actually, we usually ruin the uh, quantum mechanical characteristics. So that is how I try to illustrate how uh, peculiar and important at the same time quantum mechanics is. Now, the uh, uh, photoelectric effect. This is what Einstein described, which shows that the photon, the light uh, particle, basically, that has certain characteristics. So if light shines on the surface, then, for example, as the billiard balls hitting each other, the, then it just uh, uh, knocks uh, or knocked from it. The uh, tunneling effect on the other side, uh, in, uh, as I show, climbing through rather than climbing across it. The third is the, the uh, cat, which is half dead, half alive, until we open the box that the cat is in. So these phenomena, of course, are um, much less trivial. Uh, this was just for illustration, but these actually appear in our daily lives. And in physics, quantum mechanics has its basic characteristic. Whatever I touch, uh, wherever area I feel I'm working in, it's a gold mine because anything that we haven't uh, noticed detected before, we now see quantum mechanical 
phenomenon and, and we can explain things with quantum mechanics that we couldn't explain before. And what we see endeavors in uh, physics and mathematics now, actually, the quantum mechanics as a phenomena uh, now can be used in IT. Just imagine you have a computer and the effectiveness of this computer basically depends on the number of uh, bits in the system that it uses. We started with 16 bits, then 32 bits, now we have the 64 bit uh, computers that we're using, which uh, again led to the increase in performance capacity. So if we double the bits, then also the performance doubles. In quantum mechanics, this actually is an exponential growth. So the number of bits basically is the, on the n uh, power of n uh, is how the uh, it grows. So you could come up with computers in the future that are more uh, effective, much more effective than the current or efficient than current computers. At the moment, IBM actually working on the 50 bit of quantum. Uh, but I, they are already using 50-bit quantum uh, computers. They are not for sale. Basically, they are using the computer time, uh, selling the computer time instead of uh, and the computer capacity rather than just the computers uh, as hardware. And basically, this will be uh, a reality in the near future. Let me move on. You would think that biology is definitely something that uh, uh, quantum me mechanics has no uh, role in. That's not uh, true. This slide shows the photosynthesis. So from above, the photon from the sunbeam comes in, then the electron is generated, and the electron actually travels uh, through the molecule all the way, uh, mm, mm, but we, or biologists, uh, call the, to the reaction center. I don't really want to go into detail, but that's what happens. An electron, according to quantum uh, mechanics, uses different pathways. That's what's actually described here, the three different uh, arrows, the directions. Mm, so different pathways, and the length of these pathways are different. The waves actually reach the other side at different phases, and that causes interference. This is quantum interference, which has different and many, many consequences and effects. And in biology, also now we can see quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, I mean, it was always there, but now we are aware of it. And we keep marveling, for example, how uh, precisely uh, birds can orientate. And they exactly know where to fly. And when the weather changes, they migrate all the way back or uh, fly all the way back to their nest. The way they uh, do this is actually they're using the magnetic field of uh, the Earth, and in the brains of the birds, there's a special molecule who uses quantum mechanic processes. And uh, it's again, uh, our brain is basically is a quantum mechanical system, and humans also use it. So we are also quantum mechanical systems, and in our decisions, again, can be based on quantum mechanics. It might sound strange or uh, funny, but actually it's true. And uh, it's been put then uh, in the books as well. For example, uh, uh, in our conscience, quantum uh, uh, conscience. So politician, again, just I read this in this book. So if a politician is about to make a decision, it's a bad decision. Then according to quantum mechanics, we have uh, can have diff options for, to bring different uh, uh, decisions, and uh, the person just chose the, the wrong probability at that time. That's why it was a wrong decision. Also, there's another explanation. If there's a, a survey, a uh, public survey, asking people about certain issues that's similar to quantum mechanical me uh, measurements, uh, which might then influence uh, the decisions of these people later on. So basically what I want to uh, say is the message that without quantum mechanics, 
uh, we can't really understand social sciences either. That is why I believe here in Kursag also we have to discuss this, especially if we want to cherish Hankish's heritage. That is what I wanted to share with you, obviously. I put it very uh, in very simple terms, uh, which uh, uh, have deeper uh, connotations, definitely, but maybe I was successful in uh, igniting your interests or, or curiosity, and if you come to me with questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. So both dentists and philosophers go to the very root of problems. Everybody tries to go back to the origins of things and try to say something about the evolution of things as well. Uh, yesterday I was here to listen to a presentation when the current editor of Hankish's work uh, works uh, was happy um, to show the students of the university anything about Hankish. Well, I was a, a university student in the early 1980s, and obviously this was the book I clearly remember. I was a student of biology, and we all wanted to have this book, and whoever had it, we just grabbed it, and we wanted to read it. It was the Yorshiro Ido, the uh, Fostering Time uh, series, and the book was about uh, our social trackfalls. And also, he talked about the social issues and implications of game theory. And this is what, when we first heard this term. And this thing uh, basically reflects on the whole universe. And uh, I would like to tell you that this idea, this concept, has become very fruitful in the hands of other people. And it has um, gone beyond Hankish's ideas in this respect. So there were several waves, and it has become more professional. This discipline has become professionalized. These ideas were published in the 1970s, and there is another one in 1981. I actually don't remember anyone quoting and Hankish quoting. The Evolution of Cooperation was a book that has become a classic, it's, sorry, it's an article actually, and the two authors coming from different backgrounds, um, Axon was a politologist and Hamilton was a, a scientist dealing with evolution and biology, and this is a major focal point which I would like to address now. But the roots, if we want to go back to the very origins, they are actually even earlier, about a decade earlier, and the classic, the most classic article was entitled The Logic of Animal Conflict. Why was this a, a breakthrough, a groundbreaking article? Well, this is the first uh, article where the evolutionary game theory was first referred to. It became successful very quickly to the extent at which the majority of uh, references to game theory are of biological nature. Why is it possible? It's because a, during uh, the evolution in biological situations, populations act as if they were fully rational, which means that you survive during which you can, uh, you, well, if you can reproduce during your lifetime, if you cannot reproduce, you cannot reproduce another generation later. So this is not conscious, like obviously you shouldn't misunderstand, but biological populations uh, act in a very rational way. And this is why this was became an, uh, a successful, despite the fact that there was an earlier game theory, but this was not based on biology, but the one based on biology, you could understand the whole concept. Uh, the Price was a physicist and a chemist, and Maynard Smith was an aviation engineer. Uh, you, you, it simply shows that there are so many disciplines going towards the same focal point. 
For a long time, Hungarian public opinion remained unaffected. It didn't get into the, the public uh, discourse. We talked about Vida, Professor Vida and Professor Juhas, but as much as I can remember, the evolutionary game theory was non-existent, especially not before 1984. It was the first date, I recall, uh, there was a, a scientist, Laszlo Vekerdi, who talked about postmodern evolutionary antithesis, and this is when he mentioned the role of the evolutionary game theory. But then there was a, the selfish gene, uh, the, the book uh, translated by Istvan Shiglaki, and Dawkins in this book says that after Darwin, probably the most important contribution to the evolutionary theory was the birth of the evolutionary least stable strategies. Thank you for the help. <laughs> now, these strategies, it's something like the Nash balance. It's a kind of technique that I cannot, I need to compare to. But there is a stability criterion, which means if you have an alternative best choice, and if it's there in a small density in the population, it will not be able to break in because of the stability, if you understand. So now that we had these concepts developed, some people started to uh, observe the role of these in the cooperation. And we are now in 2003, and a very important book was published, uh, a, a, a conference proceedings. That was the title. It was very significant because the title shows that these are two things coming together again. And as our landlord uh, said it, as a kind of a hobby horse, you need to leave your comfort zone in order to reach something. So this book in 2003, this was a, a, a remarkable and significant book. Now what happened? People started to experiment in, uh, uh, among uh, controlled conditions. And there was an experimental economist from Zurich, and he tested people among these conditions, on controlled conditions, as I said, uh, and they made certain um, assumptions, and they replayed the game with people. And you could actually win or lose huge amounts of money. Imagine what happens if actually the, uh, this otka, which is a tender in, in, in Hungary, what happens if you win a tender after which uh, actually you, you, you give a lot of money to the in participants? It's unheard of uh, in the Hungarian project life. Anyway, uh, these experiments uh, broadened our view, extended our knowledge. I'm not going to go into detail, but there's something I would like to emphasize. Cooperation and the observation of cooperation in under different conditions with experiments, with models, comparative studies, whatever you can think of. So cooperation showed the, the noble savage, yeah, this, this noble, that's the absolute bullshit category. Yeah? It has never been. It was a, only an idea, and we have very good uh, statistics and data, you know, of these groups of people who were hunters and gatherers, which are still there, out there. They have been around for the past, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of years, but if we look at these groups, we, we can make a st statistics of them. And the statistics say that an average hunter or gatherer to be killed by another hunter and gatherer is larger than 
10%. So decimation was a, a correct term. And this was not limited to the fact that uh, the males actually uh, banged one another on the head. This was uh, we went back to 13,000 years ago. And you can see that the hands are tied together. Males, women, and children are there in the in the in the in the tomb. So they simply just killed one another. We don't know if there is a direct relationship, but about 13,000 years ago there was a huge impact, a meteorite, most likely, which is a pretty novel discovery. And uh, at that time the climate was still uh, fluctuating and it made the climate even worse and maybe uh, there was a, an increased conflict for the available resources and that might have led to the killing of one another and this is when people decided uh, this way to get resources. Now, this could be so much true that in 2007 Sam Woods Ball, sorry. Uh, he was an expert on microeconomics from the University of Santa Fe, or the Institute of Santa Fe, produced an article uh, in the journal Science, and basically he offers a model for a situation, what happens in a hunter-gathering society and how conflict resolution may happen. And what are the ma basic, limited, minimal items that uh, the, this kind of uh, 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 account for this dual character? He says there is a strategy, uh, which happens very frequently, and it's a recurring action, and it re-dominates the society, and it means that it's parochial and it's altruistic, and it says that one person is ready to kill the other without any particular reservations. Now, this article has been cited by uh, 700 times. It has been cited uh, 700 times, and a large number of people started to look at it. I mean, we don't know whether it's true or not, but this is a model, this is an idea, a concept, and for those who do not model things, this is an if-then kind of condition. If this is true, then the consequence will be such and such. So we don't know the, if the questions are asked in the right way, and what happens if we actually change the conditions. Now, as the cultured Chinese says, and he said something in German, but anyway, uh, after the classic article published in 2007, a lot of new articles have been published. Uh, there have been about 200 articles published on the issue. But there's one thing I would like to emphasize. And that is a consequence of the theory, and when at the time it was published, nobody foresaw that this might have such consequences. So it's very significant to learn what biological mechanisms mediate social patterns and social behaviors, and there are many, many things involved in this system. One particular thing that plays an essential role, and it's in typically in mammals, is the oxytocin, it's a hormone, and very interestingly, when I was in secondary school, we learned that this is for uh, 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 the womb, when the mother is uh, having a child and then it contracts the womb, and well, oh, I have some oxytocin, but I, I am not pregnant, I'm not expecting a baby, but it's there in my organism as well. Actually, the territorial behavior uh, is an area where oxytocin plays a major role now. Let's just get to the point. Now, if you buy oxytocin in a form of a spray, you can actually give 
uh, in, in the form of a uh, nasal spray to people. It doesn't smell actually. So in a corporation experiment, they um, put some oxytocin in the people's nose and they took a look how the, the behavior changed. Now, it was quite surprising to find that at the effect of the oxytocin, uh, the man involved in the experiment basically was they, they produced the same kind of behavior that comes from the model of parochial altruistic. So if oxytocin is given to people, men, males, there will be a large cooperation rate among the members of the group and it will increase the aggression to other groups of males. There is a hitch here because there can be two kinds of aggression. One could be defensive and one aggression type of aggression could be offensive. And it shows that the defensive aggression was more likely to occur. We don't know what the discrepancy is, but this makes science even more exciting. And this last thing, and for Jim especially, I wanted to highlight this. There is a root mace, an anthropologist from the University College of London, made or organized an experiment in Northern Ireland involving Catholics and Protestants. They didn't know, obviously, that they were undergoing <laughs> an experiment, so they, they had no idea they were being tested. But there were two experiments conducted. The first was to how probable they were to give donations to schools, how likely or intense they were. And secondly, if they find a leaf on the ground in the street, what is the probability? Sorry, a letter. It's the same word in Hungarian. So if they find a letter on the ground, would they go to a post office and would they send it? Would they post it? Uh, whether it's uh, the letter was written by a Protestant, a Catholic, or a Jew? for that matter. So in this experiment, the researcher found that it is true that this clue, in-group, out-group clue, is this is a decisive factor. So what she found was that people are, are triggered by the situation in order to be offensive to the out group, to the other group, or just, you know, in this particular situation, throw the latter into the garbage bin. But if they belong to the same group, their cooperation level did not significantly raise. Rise, sorry. So this did a side of the prediction is not as clear as we would expect. But it will be the future's task to see the contextual interlinkedness and effects that will shape the picture a little bit. When these models come out, you know, this model appeared in 2007, the author was not really serious to believe that it will generate some fantastic, you know, it will be pure gold and then he has found the explanation for all. But it was almost pure gold because it triggered 300 articles that observed, looked at the same thing from different perspectives, uh, comparative, anthropological, all kinds of aspects. And it seems now that the, the, the depth of knowledge has been extended. And then as quantum mechanics appeared in chemistry, that sort of extends the limits of our knowledge of certain disciplines. And that's that will be fruitful, even in a difficult issue like that. When it's, but it's not it's no man, no girl's game, really. We know that all these uh, problems that Professor Gelencher introduced about the environment, we either will need a kind of cooperative solution, you know, to combat this issue, or there will be no solution, and then we will be in trouble. Thank you for the attention. Uh, okay, then I'm going to ask the colleagues in, re in make a reaction to what was said in five minutes maximum. So how, what should the order be? 
two sh brief reactions, but I will need the microphone. Okay, one thing is, which is very exciting, very important in relation to climate change, this is not quite obvious, but it's there, we can sense it, that there is an anthropological, uh, anthropological sense. We are in the middle of a kind of mass extinction. If we look at the rates of extinction of species, it's 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 a large thing, and it's something that we it's unreturnable. I mean, you can't. It's irreversible. These species who are once gone, they will never return. One small part might be genetically reconstructed, or by genetic engineering, you can uh, have them come back. But that will be a very minor part. This is when uh, biology knocks the door and hello, there is a problem here. But those who don't believe in climate change, well, they should look at the, the, the changes in the habitat of the species. It's very clear. I mean, it's easy to look at it. And you have the instruments to look at this uh, nowadays. And you can see that the species are now really changing as a result of the climate change. And uh, Dan Brooks uh, shows and says that, unfortunately, there are new contact zones emerging. And these uh, actually lead to the emergence of new diseases, the first documentation of which has been uh, done. And uh, just one idea, one remark uh, concerning quantum mechanics, which I believe is extremely important, is that it's not only the esoteric ideas and uh, like as the efficiency of photosynthetic reaction, but just chemistry as such in the whole world of chemistry is unthinkable without uh, quantum mechanics. That chemical bonding cannot be interpreted without quantum physics and quantum mechanics and, and, and it gives an extra insight into chemistry. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Just a couple of remarks. One is on climate change. Everybody, all of us, feel the climate change. It is happening. We go outside of the street or just uh, switch on the television. Those opposing it say that you cannot separate human activity uh, from geological processes. You also said that uh, it existed in the past even without uh, for example, that's what Trump says actually now, so that the issue extra emission of carbon dioxide didn't exist at the past. But uh, I think we have to find ways to separate these two more efficiently. The other remark is what Birch uh, said also with that's uh, uh, based on quantum mechanics or actually, actually there is quantum mechanics in the background for example how the way various groups cooperate and it, I know that it's tremendously simplified but just as for illustration quantum mechanics describes things for example the one end of the universe there's a particle let's say an electron and the other end of the universe there's another electron if these uh, actually are uh, connected through the quantum mechanics if something happens to one the other sees this and Actually, this is also mirrored, it's possible, I think, to mirror this through biology. And that may be the background to what Ursh described about the tribal group uh, experiments. That's just another addition, just to say that you have to uh, focus on quantum uh, mechanics. About cooperation between groups. Today, there are many uh, possibilities to actually use data binding, mining methods to uh, map communication and behavior between groups. And in the US, actually, related to the uh, election, there was a survey, although 
media in the U.S. is actually uh, very colorful. There are different uh, directions and uh, support uh, that and preferences. But the preferences of a given group is almost like exclusive. They just pretend that only the media groups that they focus on exist. For example, if there would be an opposing in opinion on the other side, they refuse to even click over and, and check that out. So even in the virtual space and communication space, even without boundaries and barriers, they refuse to uh, leave their closed circles and environments. They, that's why they just stay there, they reinforce each other, and that is why these stupid ideas get reinforced, it's, uh, it's very bad, uh, although animals don't uh, have mobile phones and don't click uh, using uh, uh, these devices, but among humans, these are actually, these devices open up new possibilities, and we can uh, interpret and, and, and look at the behavior. Based. Even, uh, I think, uh, these days science has its limits. There's a lot we, we don't know. I think whatever discipline you look at, or whatever area in science you look at, there's much more what we don't know than what we do, and also there are a lot of phenomena that we're still unable to explain at the moment uh, using the current knowledge that we have. And I think quantum mechanics is about to uh, come up with new surprises, so it's possible that these phenomena, which we cannot explain or know at the moment, can be later explained with quantum mechanics about uh, or refer back to the honkish type bubble because he said that uh, mankind actually creates this protective bubble which they call uh, civilization in order to protect themselves from the nasty outside world. Ursh probably would say that the reason to come up with this bubble is just so that they can organize a cooperation among uh, people through which they actually can establish competitive and viable societies. What I'm really curious about is how these groups of symbols uh, come about. The, 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 for example, the sets of rules, like the highway code, which everybody within a group understands and follows. How do they come about? Is it engineered? Somebody just comes up with it, uh, introduces it? I don't think so. I think that this is also a result of an evolutionary process. There are these particular ideas, which actually, according to one branch of uh, the uh, evolutionists, they are replicators, also they call memes. My question is, is it possible that behind all this, that's what we that we have? So people keep trying the various ideas, and the one they survive is actually the, the one that uh, can be very, make a, a particular group more efficient in comparison with, in competition with other groups. What are your opinions? I can bring an example. For example, there are these uh, old wife tales uh, regarding weather observations. And actually, there was uh, science in itself. Uh, actually, these were, in the past, a matter of life and death, because previously, but even now, but uh, previously even more so, um, people were really prone to the effect of uh, weather and it was sometimes uh, could have proven fatal if they overlooked certain phenomena in weather. And that is why that these must have become ingrained in society, and I think that they also uh, develop through evolution, because if you didn't uh, plow your fields or sow your seeds at a particular time, then you just didn't have uh, food later on, like a Darwin, uh, uh, award winners uh, because 
that's when they had unorthodox methods in farming and agriculture. They died out. These rules are not valid anymore. Until they were, because of the, the, the weather and the climate was more or less predictable or stable in a classic sense of the world, word, now we see changes that these rules, for example, we can forget about. Now, for example, if you want to sow your seeds or plow your fields just like 10,000 years ago, then you will not uh, grow anything. And also, um, these days now we're not so, at the, so much at the mercy of weather compared to the past, because I think previously it must have been something to do with evolution, the way these habits and rules uh, were formulated. And that goes, same goes for other activities, because farming was a necessity, a very important necessity at the time, and uh, other uh, activities were related to that. I have two remarks. One, let's start with an anecdote. My intellectual grandfather, J.B.S. Holden, at the time used to start his population genetics lectures, saying there are two uh, sentences. I inherited my nose from my father, and I inherited my watch from my father. And biologists are only interested in the former. The two words, watch and nose, in Hungarian only differ with one letter, an extra R. These days, what we call is the niche construction. The niche basically is the ecological system of conditions that provides a direct responsive environment for a species. And we had to adapt to our environment as a biological population. But for example, in an, a beaver builds their den or castle or structure, their uh, offspring also inherits this structure. So for example, if we create a bubble around ourselves, you can see episodes to that in other areas of biological evolution. Similar with uh, bacteria, biofilms, for example, that the niche that the bacteria create, which then they affect uh, future generations and can have a positive feedback to the bacterium it produced it in the first place. That's one. And the other, what is really exciting in these cooperative games these days is that social norms and how they proliferate, how they spread. We have the various actions uh, that can be uh, carried out by the actors, but how, what's the basis to measure and qualify these actions as good or bad? That's so, uh, the matter of social norms, and that is a uh, cultural uh, uh, heritage, not a genetical heritage. And basically, the genetic background and the uh, social network uh, are all interrelated. This is a very large field, but uh, it's very exciting because uh, poor chimpanzees, they cannot pass on the social norms uh, just because they cannot talk about it, basically. So the appearance of language is of primary importance uh, when it comes to social norms, obviously, because actually language is the basis of the cumulative uh, evolutionary uh, traditions. Uh, thank you. Since my two colleagues were talking, but I would actually I would wanted to search and show an experiment to you. Hopefully, I can put that on the screen. In 1805, a physicist called Young actually carried out an experiment that was a screen with two, uh, punched two holes and let uh, light through the holes and then behind there were uh, uh, 
rays, uh, so the waves, the wave inter interference was detected on the other side. But this was also carried out with atoms, and the same interference was the result. This experiment was done with electrons in a way that only one electron was present at a time, so that was the screen with two holes, and one electron at a time was sent through these two holes. And the other side, as you can see, I don't know how I can just uh, go back to the beginning, so you could see the uh, interference. So the electrons are coming, one blue dot is one electron. Uh, lit up and they come and slowly but surely you can see the same interference uh, system uh, with the others so this proves that electrons cannot only form waves but also they form quantum mechanical systems and certain uh, probability for them to pass through one hole and then uh, the other and then the two interfere with, uh, inter uh, have interference in the end this is immensely interesting because if I not cover up the hole but if I know which hole the electron passed through then the interference uh, detected disappears it's the same as opening the box and uh, checking whether the cat inside is alive or dead and if after a uh, month for example I forget that they I knew that I knew then the interference comes back so quantum mechanics also in time and also in distance they represent something else so one electron is at the on one end of the uh, universe the other is on the other but they still connected so the interference was there I forgot about it if I go back and revisit the whole thing in a week the same picture is there for me uh, it's difficult to understand or you can't understand but you can get used to it so this is what I wanted to show the question I have is what do you think the probability is that in fact, other intelligent life hasn't contacted us because we're like the Republicans in Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very serious about it. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I think an answer to this question has several layers. Uh, first of all, maybe it's an age-related phenomenon, but uh, you know, uh, in my case, uh, it's not an insult, it's Sorry, a, I'm insulting myself. So. One of my fields is actually the origin of life, right? So, um, uh, as I am growing older and older, I think that uh, the origin of life from the chemical mayhem from which it starts uh, is not a very probable process. And that is what I think, okay? So, the prediction is that if you have in principle, habitable planets, you know, a thousand of them. Elfben, I mean, it's very likely, in my view, that only one of them, not even one of them, a fraction of them, we have uh, developed uh, even a primitive in the near future, because we will be able to analyze the atmospheric content of the exoplanet. Now, if we detect that the atmosphere is of thermal equilibrium on the planet, then this gives us a very good hint, not a proof, but a very good hint, that something like a bioregulation process has been taking place there. We will know in 20 years under the civilization of the planet. My expectation is, and I can be proved, I would be happy to be proved wrong, my expectation is that we are not going to see anything in this. That's my prediction. I'm sorry about all of you. Sorry? We're alone in the universe. Not necessarily, but we might be well at the second, sorry, the second thing is that, of course, once you have primitive life, even that's not a guarantee for us, because if you look at Earth's history, half of the time of all evolution was dominated by bacteria, which half is very, very close to one. So again, 
Mi a következtetés? Theorem or whatever is that given the elmélet, fact that there is life hogyha van meg valahol élet, akkor az eseteknek a 99%-ban van valami baktérium szintű élettel találkozhatunk, és az intellektuális, intelligens élet azért nagyon ritka lehet valószínűleg. Tehát nem, nem valószínű. Azért válaszom nem egy elméleti, hanem inkább egy tud egy filozófiai jellegű. A tudományban lehet kísérlet által bizonyítani dolgokat. Az elméleti részek nagyon sokféle egyetemességet tudnak bizonyítani. Annyi galaxis, amennyit csak akarnak, de hogy egy pont ilyet, amíg tulajdonképpen nem bizonyítjuk tételesen, addig csak filozófia marad, nem pedig tudomány. Something in, in relation to Mr. Professor Crow's presentation. István Bibó in the 1930s, when he wrote his uh, dissertation on um, the law, uh, science, legal science, he said that in natural sciences there are some cause and effect things, and in, in social sciences there are other determinations. Somebody in a footnote mentions quantum mechanics. And then he talks about the consequences of probability. And he says, this might be the case, but it doesn't have anything to do with cause and effect. He could see the problem, but he said, well, we have nothing to do with it. Yeah, let's just suppose that this causation principle is still there with not affected. Now, as we are still analyzing things with a cause and effect, kind of using cause, 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 causation and reasoning, uh, we cannot accept quantum mechanism in our analyses. Both Newton and Montesquieu say for the God to be able to govern the world, we need rules and regulations. Even God would not be able to govern the, the world without rules. And Einstein said the same, that probability is not a rule. You cannot accept something which is based on probability, but I think it's possible, yes, to, to have both. Either God or the rules, or if we take what, if we believe the world as a basic contingent, then well, I think the intervention of God is there to believe for us. Not every phenomenon, phenomenon has a quantum mechanical explanation that seems to have one here. Yeah? There were some psychological experiments where probability was analyzed based on the analysis. It seems that there are some quantum mechanical um, processes or at least some processing reminding us of quantum uh, mechanics. Uh, other models can produce systems or results as if they were a quantum mechanical phenomenon or phenomena, but they can be modeled without quantum mechanics. So we, we shouldn't jump to uh, conclusion that everything is laid, laden with quantum mechanics. God is always mentioned when there is a kind of a gap or a void or something inexplicable. We shouldn't do the same with quantum mechanism because that will lead to a big mess, really. Thank you for the contributions.